Thank you very much for the invitation. While the slides are coming up, I'll mention that I have no conflicts of interest to declare. I, I declare I also want to make a sort of disclaimer. When you give a part of an educational course like this, you're told what title to present about. So I was asked to talk about limitations and caveats of deep learning. So I'm actually probably a little bit more enthusiastic about machine learning methods than you might get from this talk, but I'm trying to do my job and talk about the caveats. Maybe you'll think I've done it too enthusiastically, in fact. All right, just stepping back for a minute. In medical imaging, we have lots of steps in the data processing chain. We acquire data, reconstruct images, process, eventually leading to either diagnosis or interpretations, quantitative parameters, et cetera. And there's the opportunities for machine learning in every one of these stages. The most obvious place, the one we've heard the most about, is, is in the post-processing step. You've got your reconstructed images, you apply some sort of machine learning-based method, classification or regression to it to get some kind of quantitative numbers or a diagnosis or interpretation out of it. If you work at Google, this is the obvious place to start. And in fact, there's many ISMRM sessions about this topic, and there was a special issue of the IEEE transactions on medical imaging on this topic a couple years ago. A place that might be less obvious, unless you turn, heard the previous uh, speaker, is uh, applying machine learning in the context of image reconstruction, where we're going from the raw data to the reconstructed images. I actually think this might be an easier place for machine learning because the bar is a little bit lower. When you were trying to do machine learning for, say, image diagnosis, we're competing against human eyes that have been, you know, evolved for centuries. Uh, whereas, in general, image reconstruction historically has been based on very simple image models such as total variation that just looks at the difference between neighboring pixels. And there's probably a lot more information than just how neighboring pixels relate that we can incorporate with data-driven methods in the reconstruction process. Also, humans are very good at looking at images, but not so good at looking sinograms or case-based data. And in fact, this is a very timely topic because there was just a special issue this month on using machine learning in the context of image reconstruction in the IEEE transactions on medical imaging. There's also um, a whole session on this topic on Tuesday. A more speculative opportunity for machine learning that was already alluded to in the first talk by Dr. Erickson this morning is trying to go directly from the raw data to through some sort of magic machine learning method to interpretation. When I first started preparing this talk, I thought I would say, well, as far as I know, nobody's done doing this yet, but a couple weeks ago, I was at a CT conference where researchers from GE were extracting vessel diameters directly from CT sinograms and kind of some preliminary work. I haven't read archive in the last few hours, so for all I know, somebody's already going directly from case space to some corner of interpretation. Maybe there's even abstracts here at ISMRM that I haven't seen yet. We are in the imaging business. I do think we're going to want to keep making images, although it is quite possible that the images that are best for human interpretation are not the same as the best images for putting through some sort of uh, machine learning based processing. And just to clarify one thing that Dr. Erickson mentioned, the, unit, the Fourier transform is a unitary transform, so there is no loss of information when we take the FFT. It gets more complicated with undersampling and parallel uh, MRI, but uh, with a basic single coil, there's fully sampled data, there's no loss of information there. Uh, there's one more opportunity in this data processing chain for machine learning, and that's in the data acquisition process itself, especially if we're undersampling, we have the opportunity to design what kind of sampling patterns we're going to use. And there's a recent work on, on machine learning based methods where you use data from training examples to optimize the sampling patterns in a data driven way. So far those results are only for a single coil. It's not clear to me how to generalize it to parallel MRI, but there's probably talks on ISMRM about that too as well. So now I'm going to focus, because I'm an image reconstruction person, a little bit on machine learning for image reconstruction. You're going to hear a lot more about that from speakers after the break. There's many ways to do this, and I'm supposed to talk about the caveats of each. So the, the fast ways, you'll see many papers that emphasize the speed of applying deep learning and machine learning methods for image reconstructions. Those generally are in basically enhancement techniques. You either take the raw case-based data uh, and enhance in some way, or more likely do a poor image reconstruction, such as a zero-filled inverse FFT, and then try to enhance that in some way. And there's both patch-based and whole image-based methods for doing that. And the caveat here is that there's probably some compromise between computation and image quality. If there's something that a machine learning can, method can learn about how to denoise an image as a post-processing procedure, we can probably take those same ideas, incorporate that into an iterative reconstruction algorithm and get even better results at the price of more computation. There are also not as fast methods that you can use machine learning image reconstruction. You can, uh, for example, try to auto-tune the regularization parameters. Uh, using machine learning methods, or use machine learning to provide a good, hopefully good, initial image that you then put into a conventional, whatever that means, image reconstruct, iterative reconstruction algorithm, thereby saving some compute time. 
Of course, these methods might not fully exploit the full potential of machine learning. Another approach is to take a poor reconstructed image, put it through a machine learning based method to get a hopefully better image, and then use that better image as some kind of prior for a subsequent iterative reconstruction that models the physics and the sampling of the system. If you use p equals 2 in this prior, then this will be fast. You might even be able to solve it with inverse FFT if you got fully sample, oh, excuse me, if you have a single coil data. On the other hand, using p equals 1 will probably make your reconstruction more robust to any errors in that initial prior image that came out of your deep learning method. Uh, but then it's a more complicated optimization problem. And you'll see papers like this in the literature. As we've just heard in Thomas Pock's talk, there is uh, also you can take any iterative algorithm and treat it as a recurrent network, an unrolled loop with learned components, learned filters, and so on. And that comes with all the caveats of other CNN type methods that I will be talking about later in my talk. So I won't dwell on that. An area that I'm particularly intrigued by that's uh, emerging is using a nonlinear encoder methods for machine learning based image reconstruction. So a nonlinear encoder is a nonlinear mapping that maps some low dimensional latent parameter space that I've denoted by the vector z into your high dimensional image or perhaps patches in that image. And the first way that this has been proposed in the context of compressed sensing is in the synthesis form where you minimize over the latent parameters the generated image that best fits your case based data according to your model for the physics of the scanner. And then your final reconstructed image uh, is the generated image from those latent parameters. Um, the caveat of doing image reconstruction this way is you're going to get an image in the range of your generator. And if your generator can't describe the full, domain, uh, full space of images of interest, um, you're going to be missing some details. And this is, in general, a highly challenging non-convex minimization problem. An alternative that I find more appealing is to use the generator as a form of regularizer. So in, we're going to minimize a data fit term plus a encoder-based regularizer that takes each candidate image X and compares it to the output of a generator for some set of latent parameters that need to be minimized. This provides you the opportunity to be robust to uh, incompleteness, if you will, of your generator model, but it does lead to a more complicated double minimization problem because now you're both minimizing over the image and minimizing over the latent parameters. So that is not going to save you computation. For those of you who are not familiar with generative models, let me just give a little bit of an overview here, taking results from a Jupyter notebook that you can download and play with uh, yourself. So here's a case where uh, in this work they're mapping a two-dimensional input space, which is two, the latent parameter here is just two variables, z1 and z2, and mapping it through a nonlinear deep network with 13 layer CNN into the, into the digits, okay? So there's the latent parameters. These are the generate many generated images. Each of those images is a 28 by 28 patch. So there's incredible dimensionality reduction here, right? Each of these little images is whatever 28 squared is dimension yet we're generating all of those from only two numerical parameters. Uh, and each of the colors here corresponds to a different digit. Now, this is pretty exciting, but when I first looked at, or after I, my second look at this, I started to say, well, where are the fours? They're kind of hidden here in between the sevens and the nines, and that's fine, but if this is a tumor or some other patient uh, important uh, detail in a rare disease or whatever, one has to worry about uh, whether it's completely describing the space of interest. Uh, the fancy examples that you see on the web now are not just digits, but more complicated, uh, even anthropomorphic things like, like faces, all right? So here is from a recent paper by Google where they're generating faces using one of these uh, generated adversarial networks. Um, faces do not live on a subspace. They live in a manifold. Here's two images. Uh, if you just did linear interpolation of those images, linear combination of those images, you would see something that looks like a um, a double exposed for photograph, right? Two images uh, superimposed on each other. That's a sort of quick proof that images, faces, do not live on a subspace. But apparently they do live in a manifold and you can sort of go between faces um, in a sort of smooth way on that manifold using these kind of nonlinear encoder models. And according to the paper, this sets a new milestone in visual quality, quoting from that paper. But if you take one of these images in the interpolated space and zoom in, you see some interesting characteristics that are probably not physically realistic, right? These blue spots here are just some little blip that came out of some ReLU or some weight or some filter somewhere in that network. And OK, it's maybe not the end of the world for Hollywood entertainment purposes, but if this is a tumor or some important medical feature, we'd have to be worried about it. 
All right, so now stepping away from image construction, I'm going to talk about some of the limitations and challenges in, in machine learning and deep learning methods in particular. First thing I've done is to stole two slides from the uh, first speaker, Dr. Erickson, from his synopsis online. So here's two examples he mentioned, the ImageNet challenge and the, uh, the uh, retinal images. So the ImageNet currently is up to 14 million images, and as he mentioned at the time, there was trained with about a million images. This data set here had 100,000 images. There's a recent Nature paper that had 100,000 images. There's a chess x-ray study recently that had 100,000 images. Now, Dr. Erickson also showed an example with only about 400 images to train. And so the big question is, what data size do you actually need for your application practice? And I don't think there's a good answer to that. As Dr. Pock noted, this is an area where theory really needs to be developed. Now, any caveat that I talk about is a well-known problem, and people are working on it. So for example, this question of data size, um, if, you do, if one way to get more data is to work on patches instead of the entire image, because if you take, say, 16 by 16 patches out of your data set, suddenly you have a lot of training patches instead of a few. Also, there's a whole approach called transfer learning, where you take a network that was pre-trained for some other application, and then maybe adapt the final layer or layers of it to your medical imaging application. But the question of data size is a big caveat. Uh, another caveat that Dr. Pock already alluded to is the question of local, local minimizers. Um, people are also working on this to try to circumvent this issue because uh, neural ne network training is a highly non-convex problem. A recent paper has the provocative title, Adding One Neuron Can Eliminate All Bad Local Minima. They basically add one neuron that has an exponential activation function, and then they show that all of the local minima are now good, uh, good minimizers. The caveat is this is only for uh, binary classification at this point, but this is recent work, and I imagine as time goes on, people will continue to tackle this problem. Um, as also has been alluded to already, neural network methods can be fooled. All right, so here is an example of a CNN uh, trained to recognize handwritten digits, and here is a handwritten digit that I'm sure you will all immediately recognize, even if you're not a trained radiologist. But this neural network is very, very confident this is a zero, and this in this case, the neural network is very confident that this is a two, or maybe a zero. Now, these are adversarial concoctions. These are images deliberately concocted to fool the network. But you have to wonder if your MRI scanner might accidentally produce some data that has some background noise in this that might fool your network. There's other examples you'll find online of like fooling uh, classifiers to think that a banana is a toaster. This actually kind of looks like a toaster to me. Uh, and another, you know, you have to have a cat example, so there's another example of a cat that the neural network is very confident is guacamole. All right. <laughs> now, interestingly, if you take this cat and just rotate it slightly, then the neural network gets it right again, which just illustrates how nonlinear the input to output relationship is in these neural networks. Now, what I'd hope to, if you're totally new to neural networks, and I'm sure there's many people in the room that are more experts than I am, uh, one way to get an easy introduction to it is go to this website called playground.tensorflow.org. And I was hoping to give you a live demo, but unfortunately these computers are not on the web, so we can't actually go to that website right now. But this is a browser-based, you don't have to download any software, you just go in your browser and you can start adding neurons and playing with a number of layers and applying to both classification and regression problems. So this is all being done in the simplest possible setting you can visualize, which is two dimensions, where you have basically two input parameters, and let's say you're trying to classify between the blue and the orange sets of pixels, right? Patients with tumors and without tumors, or however you want to think about it. And since I can't I anticipate the possibility that we might not be able to, oh, sorry, let me go back a slide. Um, so in this case, um, where the two classes are well separated, in fact, a line between them suffices to separate the two classes. We don't need deep learning for that. And one of the educational outcomes here is to recognize the difference between deep learning and classical machine learning. I actually did not need this many neurons to do this problem. I could have just had two, two inputs and one output because this is a problem that a single hyperplane can separate the two classes. That's just classic linear discriminant analysis, you know, data science 101. But if your data is, lives more on a manifold than on a subspace, right, where you have two sets here that are separated by a circle, then you start to need more neurons uh, and more layers to, to do a good job of separating those two groups, even in two dimensions. Now, the fun, it, I really wish I could have done the live demo because it's mesmerizing to watch the data flow through these, uh, 
<laughs> these links. But just playing with this for a few minutes and you got, start to get a sense of the enormous number of choices that are involved uh, in designing neural networks. All right, so first of all, there's architecture choices. Is your input just the data or is it function of the data? This network lets you put in uh, squares and products of the input data. How many layers? How many neurons per layer? What activation functions do you want to use? What cost function do you want to use? Do you want regularization? None, or L1 or L2? What parameter do you want for that? Are you doing regression and classif classification? And then on the algorithm side, le what learning rate do you want? What batch size do you want? The number of epochs. These are all things that you can play with just in this simple JavaScript, I think, based um, uh, web interface. And if you look in the literature more deeply, there's lots of even more choices that have to be made. Um, often the data should be scaled before you put it in your network. You need to do something called batch normalization. You might need dropout, we've heard about. And then the choice of loss function is a huge one. In the literature, there's many, many choices. Um, and it's been shown, mean squared error is probably the most common choice in denoising and image reconstruction problems and other regression problems, but that's been shown that it can oversmooth details because it's looking at the image as a whole, not at fine details. In fact, it's even been argued that the training loss function may be more important to your results than this choice of network structure. If you go back more than 20 years, uh, the idea of training networks not based on generic criteria like mean squared error, but based on the imaging task. If we're trying to detect whatever, myocardial stenosis or something like that, then that doesn't make any sense, then uh, you should train your neural network for that task rather than using generic loss functions. Uh, and then finally, how do you evaluate your network? And so the, the point here is there's a lot of handcrafting that goes in here. I grow a little, I chuck a little bit every time I hear somebody talk about how traditional machine learning involves a lot of handcrafting and in deep learning you just put the data in and out it comes magically. There is a lot of handcrafting at this stage in the field that's going into this. Um, I've already mentioned the, the issue of local minimizers. Even just playing with this very simple two-dimensional example in this website, I already experienced how stochastic descent can reach dramatically different answers for a simple binary classification problem. One run of the network led to this terrible classifier, oh, excuse me, this good, <laughs> good classifier that does a good job of separating the blue from the orange training data, and then another run of the exact same uh, network produce this absolute terrible classifier. So, you know, this is a simple illustrative example where we can see that one is good and one is terrible, but when you're working in high dimensions, it's going to be much harder to visualize. Of course, people are working on this. Um, some other caveats, if you spend too much time doing deep learning, your math skills may atrophy. There's a recent review paper on GAN methods that had exactly one question. This is probably unprecedented in the history of the IEEE signal processing magazine. Um, in MRI, our data is complex. Many of the software tools that are used by Google and Facebook do not handle complex data, so you have to deal with that. Um, I'm going to say a little bit more about generalizability in a minute. I also want to make a comment about fair comparisons. People will spend days training their CNN, but then they'll use the default parameters for some comparison method. That might not be a completely fair way to do a comparison. A recent survey paper pointed out that a lot of the papers in this field aren't described completely enough to really reproduce what the results were. So when you're reviewing papers or writing papers, try to make your descriptions complete. And then there's an issue of problem size, right? You know, most of the Google stuff is on two-dimensional images, whereas a lot of what we care about in medical imaging is three-dimensional or even dynamic imaging, and then you might run into issues with memory constraints on your GPU. These are all sort of standard caveats of dealing with, with uh, deep learning and the like. Let me make a comment about generalizability. This is from a paper about CT, but CT is very much analogous to radial sampling in MRI. So think about this as radial sampling. This is a paper from Michael Hunter's group again where uh, they, they trained a neural network to handle sparse view CT with 143 views and then examined performance as you decrease the number of views, equivalently decrease the number of radial samples in MRI. And of course, you'd expect the performance to grade. But if at some number of views over here, they retrain the network specifically for that number of views, then they can get much better performance. So in other words, you know, the, the, there's a lack of generalizability here because you need a new training every time you change some characteristics of the sampling pattern. Now, I have seen other more recent work where people have trained with different amounts of undersampling the same neural network. So there's a third, another curve that really belongs on here, which is what if you sort of try to train a universal neural network that is trained with lots of different amounts of undersampling. Uh, and I, I presumably it's probably somewhere between these two curves. Uh, 
another caveat, deep learning is not necessarily better depending on your application. So in that same paper from APFL, they trained deep learning methods using 500 ellipse images. So synthetically generated images uh, consisting of ellipses like that with a fancy UNet architecture. And they actually found in this application that just a standard total variation based image reconstruction worked much better than CNN, 27 dB versus 22 dB. Of course, this is an application where you'd expect total variation to work very well because these images are piecewise constant and that fits the sort of model that goes with total variation very well. And when you zoom in here, you can really see the difference in image quality. So don't think of deep learning as a panacea that's the best option for all, for all applications. Uh, let's see, how am I doing on time? I think I've got enough time to call, talk about uh, a couple alternatives. So for image reconstruction, not everything has to be deep. So uh, in another data adaptive, machine learning inspired approach to image reconstruction that's not deep is to take training data and learn either a dictionary or a sparsifying transform for that data or convolutional versions thereof and then do image reconstruction where you minimize a data fit term plus a regularizer and for example in the sparsifying transform version of the regularizer you extract all the patches from each candidate image and you, you apply this sparsifying transform to it and you compare it to some coefficients that you're going to learn uh, that you encourage to be sparse. So in words you're trying to find an image of all the images that fit the data very well find the one whose patches can be best sparsified by some sparsifying transform that you learn from training data. So this is data driven. It's uh, the blind version. Uh, you're learning the transform at the same time you're doing reconstruction. The non-blind version, you're learning the transform from training data. Now, this is not deep. It does involve a double minimization, both over the image and over these transform coefficients. I tend to think it's a little bit less of a black box. Maybe to you, if you're not familiar with this, this equation is opaque, but to me, I can look at the tr dictionary, the transform co coefficients, and get some sense of what it's doing. It's also non-convex, by the way, uh, due to the zero norm here. Um, now, so let me uh, wrap that in with a, the caveat that I think careful comparisons are, are needed when, when comparing deep learning methods to alternatives. So this, I, my group has also worked on the kind of unruled loop kind of algorithm that, that Tom just described, where we've trained a uh, unruled algorithm with 20 iterations, excuse me, I mean layers, with a bunch of image patches, and we've learned the transform coefficients and so on. Um, and then we've tested on five different images. And here's a table, lots of numbers, and I'll give you the big take home message here. So of course, if you just do a zero filled inverse FFT for various undersampling factors, you get terrible results. If you apply sparse MRI, which is a combination of total variation and wavelets as a, as a fixed uh, regularizer, you get you know, somewhere on the order of one dB PSNR improvements. If I use a transform based, learn transform based regularizer, we can get another dB so improvement. And if we use the unrolled loop, we don't see any additional improvement beyond that. So the big gain was going from, say, total variation as a generic sign of regularizer to an adaptive regularizer. But this one is not deep. It's just a single sparsifying transform for each patch. So as you're reviewing papers and looking at talks and so on, think about the comparisons. Are they being, are they being compared to something that is a sort of a contemporary regularizer or something like total variation that's a couple decades old? Uh, okay, I need, do need to make the point, though, this is the most expensive in terms of computation time. Certainly, the unrolled loop is the fastest of these alternatives. So speed is your goal, deep is the way to go. All right, also, deep learning is not necessarily needed for every application MRI. If you're doing quantitative MRI and you want to take your reconstructed images and turn those into quantitative parameters like T1 and T2, Traditionally, we have done this with nonlinearly squares estimation or for higher dimensional problems using dictionary matching, which is equivalent to a version of maximum likelihood. Uh, more recently, machine learning methods have been applied to this quantification problem. Uh, you can use deep neural networks for this, certainly, and there's a number of papers on that. The caveat here is you need relatively long training or times, or you can use a classical uh, uh, machine learning method such as kernel regression, which trains much faster and I would argue is more interpretable than a deep neural network. And I'll just show you one colorful picture illustrating that you can get nice quantitative maps with uh, less computation than you would need for uh, dictionary matching or, or nonlinear least squares using a traditional kernel regression machine learning approach. 
All right, so in summary, I, I, you'll certainly see over the morning there's much excitement about deep learning. There's many challenges. We want artificial intelligence, apparently, but we don't want artificial features in our reconstructed images. And I'll just summary, if you think I'm being too negative, let me just uh, quote a machine learning expert at Google who recently at an IPS presentation, he likened the machine learning, especially deep learning, I believe, methods to alchemy, where there's a lot of trial and error. He got a standing ovation for this, by the way, at this machine, le machine learning conference. And in an interview with him, he talked about, he said, researchers do not know why some algorithms work and others don't nor do they have rigorous criteria for choosing one AI architecture over another. And I think this has been alluded to multiple times this morning, that we really need more theoretical developments in terms of what architecture do we need, how much training data, and so on. So I hope you also get the take-home message that deep learning is just one tool in the machine learning toolbox, and it's not necessarily the only tool you'll need. Uh, and then I will post these uh, slides online because there's over 50 references if you're interested in further reading. Thank you very much for your attention.